right. I've been cert CPI certified for quite a while, and then I took my retirement with uh, Tracy and Ann LeBond. They're our district CPI trainers, and they have been gracious to come over and give the training to us with some tweaks uh, for the bus situation. Typically, this thing is like given for teachers and classroom yeah. settings. They've done one for security. We have to land kind of in between. We're not security, we're not classroom, we're stuck in the middle. So hopefully uh, they're going to be able to unpack this for us in a way that we'll be able to use on the bus. Okay? You're going to want some interaction as we go along too. Oh, yeah. oh, no. yeah. Did everyone sign the sheet? If you have not, you're not going to get credit, you won't get paid. Alright? These handbooks that I'm checking out You need to keep these for the entire session because they're yours to write in and work through. And on the back is your card, your certification. This won't get signed off till the end. So if you don't have your book, you can't get signed off and certified. Sign in sheet? Right. Uh, it was right there. Right, right there. there. Right there in the picture books. Oh. Does everybody have a writing utensil? We've got, I have some, if, if we're running out. Or do you have some? Do you have a whole lot of them? Any other? Any other? Any other? <laughs> Randy, you know how many of those times you're going to get back, right? I'm done. Everybody good on this? No, look, you keep the entire progress and then turn it in and you don't sign up. They will verify that you did. Okay, so I think everybody has something to write with and you kind of started putting up the workbooks. So, um, Again, this is not really kind of sort of medical training, and so we're going to try, we're going to look to you guys to really make it yours. So Ann and I are going to do our best to um, help you make it so it's going to work for you on the bus and on bus situations. This is very unique. You guys have a unique job, and so it's, it's new for us, so you got to help us along as we go for these next three nights. So again, it is a three-session training. Um, you do need to attend all of the training. Um, for this to kind of help for you guys. So again, my name is Tracy Davis, and I'm a para at the high school. I've been there about 13, 14 years or something. Um, and then I've been teaching CPI for quite a while, too. Um, I'll, I'll just stop there. I won't go into any more of the background. But this is Anne LeBond. Yep, and I am the special ed lead over at uh, Prairie View Elementary. I see a lot of our ladies in the front here that I see on a regular basis. Um, or that I hear your names constantly from some of our students. You guys uh, I've been in the district for 15 years. I was at uh, the kindergarten center. If any of you have been around that long, the kindergarten center, right? Um, and now I'm at Fergie. All right. So we're going to just kind of get started. We This training is, there's a lot going on in this training, all three sessions. So we kind of really keep rolling, uh, which is why we always ask you just to, you know, bring your water, bring your snacks or whatever, because we got to keep keep going. You guys know this building far better than I do, so you know that the restrooms are out the door. If you need to use the restroom, feel free to get up and go ahead and do that as needed, um, getting drinks and things like that. We're going to just keep on going. We will take one short 10 to 15 minute break, um, kind of midway through this evening and as, as well as the other two nights. So, um, 
but again, we're going to try to make this training for you and pertain to you. So we need your help and interaction in doing that. So if we're talking about stuff and we need you to make it as it might be on the bus, okay? We're going to start with just the pretest. So open up your workbooks. These workbooks are for you to keep. They are yours as a resource. Take notes all the way through as needed. I highly recommend that you do that. Um, you, know, you don't have to write verbatim what you see on the PowerPoint because it's really wordy. And it's kind of annoying. You can paraphrase and summarize. But let's just start with the pretest just to get you going on what your thoughts are. You probably won't know a lot of this information, but we want to get your brains going so you kind of see what this claim is about. So, we're just going to give you a few minutes to do the best that you can. You're not going to turn it in. You don't need to put your name on it. It'll stay with you in your workbook. We'll talk about it in about three, four minutes. Lisa's not here, right? Um, Physical aggression. Violent. Physical verbal. aggression. What else did I hear? Violent. Verbal. Yeah. Spitting. Verbal. Yeah. yeah. Spitting. Spitting. Hitting. Stonewalling. Yeah. Kicking. Crying. Kicking. 
Banging their heads, biting. biting. You've seen a lot of stuff going on with us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So all of that, right, are kind of examples of some of these things. And then, what are our corresponding staff approaches to that? So, say you're seeing spitting, or you're seeing hitting. What are some of those staff approaches or responses? How are we responding as staff? Verbal de-escalation techniques. Verbal de-escalation. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a specific example? Uh, when a student is very set in the course of something that's making them aggressive or uh, upset, you can derail them by bringing up something that you know they like. Yeah. Totally changing the subject. There you go. Distraction or bringing up something else. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. How do we respond when we're seeing some of these things? Remain calm. Remain calm. Absolutely. Speak a calm voice. Calm voice. Yeah, those are all good. Yes. What's upsetting them, or if you can help them, what you can do to help them? What you can do to help them? How can I help you? Stay alert. Yes. So, can you expand on that a little bit? situations so that it doesn't maybe snowball or get worse and escalated and other students might join in and uh, be aware of all your whole all of your surroundings and what's happening around you with the other kids and this student. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's possible we use the target if we're targeting another student or, you know, possible. Yep. If possible, remove the target or separate students and things like that. Yep. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Yes, we're right on target. Okay. Yeah. Good. So number three, crisis results in a traumatic experience for an individual. Who said true? true. So we've got about maybe half or so. Um, so half of you then said false. Some of you who said false, can you, I'd like you to explain what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. I didn't say anything. I don't understand what you said. Okay. Okay. And so, you didn't answer the question. Okay. So the question is basically, do you believe that um, a, a crisis situation would end in, would cause a traumatic experience? Is that traumatic for a person to go through a crisis? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 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 What's that? The crisis situation results in traumatic. They have to be aware of the crisis. They have to hear about it. Mm -hmm. The crisis might have occurred 10 years ago. No, no, we're talking about current events, right? Current. Then, then. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the question. Yep, and so the, the question might be a little yeah. tricky. So it's basically, basically, you guys, there's no right or wrong answer mm -hmm. to that. I think it's all how we look at it. Yeah, so it's just, it's, 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 yeah, how yeah. you look at it makes it traumatic or not traumatic. Yeah, yep, and that could be true too. Yeah, so a crisis situation then, it could, you know, it does seem like it could be traumatic to an individual. It's a crisis, you know, that things were escalated, there was anxiety, um, things were out of control maybe, if you will, so that might seem traumatic. Others might say, you know, it wouldn't need to be traumatic um, because you know that there's an end to every crisis situation or things like that. So there's a couple of different ways to look at it. No right or wrong answer, just get me thinking about crisis in general, okay? Um, why are you attending this training session? To get insight, to reflect, maybe you were told you have to come. <laughs> right? That's okay. I mean, that's fine. That's good. We're glad you're here, no matter why. Better answer about how to handle So hopefully we'll make this enjoyable for you. They are just not going to show. We've been told this. We're going to be sometimes. Um, <laughs> uh, so have you ever needed a hand on an ag agitated individual? Yeah, I mean that's that's why we're here, right? So, yeah. So this was just meant to kind of get you going and thinking about what we're going to be talking about in the next three minutes, okay? Um, so the next piece we're going to turn to is page. Where's my page? Page 
page seven in your workbook. So if you could turn to page seven, and we're going to have Anne is going to talk about um, the crisis development model, and this is kind of like the nuts and bolts of this training. Everything we talk about in the next three nights is going to go back to this model. So it all kind of goes back to this model. This is what it's all about. Okay. Okay. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to what she said, but um, so the whole premise of this is that as the crisis develops, it has distinct stages that we need to recognize and that we need to have um, an approach to each distinct level of escalation. And so that's really the basics of what we're going to do. Um, the first uh, stage is anxiety. And anxiety can look like a bunch of different things for kids. And especially with ki uh, kids with disabilities, it can look really different. It can look like they're happy. It can, they can be giggling, they can be laughing, but we know that's anxiety. Um, really what it is, is a noticeable increase or change in behavior. So it can be anything that's different from what you think their norm or their typical is. Um, you know, and thinking about the bus, because they've got, you know, pacing, you know, I know kids aren't really pacing on the bus, they're, are, are they? No, they're them in. I like that idea. Um, some of the other things I think are the scripting. I'm sure a lot of you guys have kids with um, autism on the bus, and you hear them go into those where they're kind of talking to themselves. And really what they're doing is they're replaying the last video that they saw. Um, and scripting is the sign of anxiety because when they do that, it's calming. They're trying to calm myself. Or insistence on having one particular item, like a security item. And the more they insist, the more you know that that anxiety is going up. Anything else you guys can think of that you would notice on, on the bus with kids where anxiety looks like it's an issue? <laughs> yeah, you just see physically they're kind of moving. A lot of them are just facial expressions. Some of the facials, yeah. their face changes physically. Yeah. yeah. Um, frustration. They look frustrated. Yeah. Um, Insistence on sameness and routine. I don't know if any of you ever have to take a different turn or go a different way in your route when you've got a kid that is very used to one way. You're going to tick them off right away. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say very similar. Um, or if you do take a different direction or you're a new driver for a route. Ah. Or even I'm sure for some of our standbys that take the place for special ed drivers. Um, the other thing that I heard of, I haven't really noticed it quite yet, but I guess um, is self mobilization I mean, I, I know yeah. I know that it's been known to happen where if they have anxiety, they start to hurt themselves. Yep, them. yep, yep, self-harm. So yeah, a lot of, um, you know, hitting their own hand, that sort of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that kind of comes into the next level. Yep, too. What, once we get there, we, we already know, ooh, wow, what, what sign did we miss? Some of this stuff is so subtle that um, because we, kids are scripting all the time, it's, it's sometimes their norm. Well, you know, we need to be aware that they may constantly be living in an anxious state. Every time they get on that bus, it's nerve-wracking. I know I'm going to school, it's either going to be rough at school, or, you know, there's kids on that bus that, I'm, that make me nervous. They might be getting on, in that anxious state from the get-go, okay? And then um, our response to that is to be supportive. And really it's just to recognize that being supportive means I can see that he's anxious, I can see that he's uncomfortable or that she's uncomfortable right now, and that we can do anything to, to, to calm them. So if they want that particular item that they're holding on to, that would be okay for you to have your security item. Um, you know, if I want to put my backpack over here because it always goes here, um, let, yeah, let, let's do that. And what we mean by being um, non judgmental is just because it doesn't freak us out doesn't mean that it doesn't freak them out. And that's okay. You know, that's what I mean by, gosh, they've never had a problem with this in the last five days and now it's a big deal. 
you know, yep, it is a big deal today, and we have to be cool with that. Yeah? Yeah, I'm standby, so usually if I'm driving someone to the place, I, I right away tell them my name, and I'm filling in for Sandy. And Sandy will be back? Or whoever, yeah. Come on. Will he be back? I don't know. Well, will Sandy be back? Will Sandy be back? Yes, Sandy. Sandy on a meeting? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But that's great that you do that to try to alleviate yeah. some of that anxiety of somebody doing and I'm amazed how months later I won't necessarily remember their names, but they know me right away. They'll know you right away. Oh, yes. 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 All this is bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can give them any sort of predictability yeah. in whatever's going to happen next, you've alleviated that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Let me know your name. That this, uh, you know, we'll be doing this route, but not tomorrow. It, it is, it seems like it's such a minor thing, but it is huge when a kid has that much anxiety. So, I mean, you're de-escalating already just by doing those little things that you all can do. Just know that. Okay. Uh, that second stage is when um, we're, we're, we're escalating now. Now we're going into the defensive stage. This is where they're losing the rationality a little bit. Things are necessarily making sense. Um, they're belligerent. They challenge the authority. You know, you're not the boss. Um, this is typically where I say I get fired quite a bit. Um, you know, you're not bus, call my mom. Um, yeah, I get a lot of time off. Go down if I call your mom first because that's you know my job. <laughs> uh, anything else you guys can think of when kids get defensive? We're past anxiety now. Now we're we're getting a little bit more agitated. What does that look like on the bus sometimes? I think we should deal with it. Yeah. I don't have to do that. You don't know nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they starting, you know, do kids always have the, the, so this is my, this is what I wonder about on the bus. Do they always have their same spot on the special ed bus? Yes. 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 Do you ever have to switch it because somebody else yeah. comes on? Yeah. And that would be upsetting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then would they become belligerent at that time for you? Would they refuse? I'm not leaving the spot. Maybe would that be where you know, they move up a, a level? Yeah, because yeah, that would be defensive then. If they're just like, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. No. And then, and how can that work too though? That can look different ways. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be getting to that more later. We do yeah, break right down this level later. There's a whole continuum that will break this down later. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then our response to um, when a kid is escalating and they're, they're entering that defensive stage, we're going to be um, directive. This is where we're really specific. Um, we take a lot of the language out. <coughs> Cut your sentences down to like this. Um, sometimes we do no verbal. Um, but this is where it's really, you know, this is where I feel like we're on. Um, with kids with anxiety, I feel like that's kind of my job all the time because their kids are always sort of in that state. And I feel like that's very natural for me in my job. This is where I feel like, oh, uh, crap, I'm on. You know, I have to think about it a little bit more. And, you know, it's always in the back of my mind, what's my next step? What's my next step? Because this is where we can, re this, is, this is the crucial part to me because you can go one of two ways. You go up or you go down. And up is not fun for me. I was just curious what, so you're on the bus and now you see that the kid is maybe getting in a defensive stage or they're starting to escalate and they're starting to question you and do all these kinds of things. What will it look like on the bus for you to be directed? Like what could you do if somebody's just refusing to leave their seat or, I mean, what, what does it look like? Help us out. Okay. Are your choices? Yeah. Tell them what happens, what their consequences are, each choice. We couldn't hear what you said. Okay, so she was saying, you know, give them, give them a couple of choices. And that's, that is being directed. You just, because now we're not, um, you know, we're still supportive, but we're not, um, it's pretty much, we are just hearing those choices. But, you know, 
I hesitate to say that because that does require a lot of talking, a lot of language. And really, this is just really specific. You can sit here or you can sit there. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that more specifically when we, we break, it, break it down in the other level. So let's hit uh, next. Okay, so this is that once we've escalated beyond that, um, this person is out of control, they're acting out, they're physically acting out. Um, this is either physically or verbally aggressive. <coughs> And then what we do is nonviolent is the point we're going to learn some safe ways to keep ourselves uh, safe and the uh, students as well. And we'll do all of this for the second and the third. Right. Yeah. And I know most people, I don't know if the, you guys do, but you know, kind of in the and Paris think this is where this this training that this is what it is. I'm going to go learn holds and restraints for students. And I really like to think about it as we should be learning and spending the majority on the of the time on how to keep kids calm and regulated. I never want to go here. I hate it. I hate it here. Um, so really, what we need to do is put all of our effort into a proactive approach and keep kids calm and regulated so we don't have to go into, uh, we don't have to go hands on. We want to stay up in one and two or you know, one and two. That's what yeah. we really want to do. That's the training school. Yeah. All right, that last level is tension reduction. This is where we can tell that that meltdown is over. It's a noticeable kind of decrease in, in that physicality. Um, you know, sometimes this is where the kids are crying because it's over. Um, sleep. Any other examples? I don't know on the bus. If you've ever had any major meltdowns on the bus, what does it look like when it's over?
right here, there's a picture of this. It looks a little bit different in the back of your workbook. But this is truly the philosophy of CPI. CPI stands for Crisis Prevention Institute. And basically, we always call it CPI because it's easier to say than nonviolent crisis intervention training. So we always call it CPI training. But um, Crisis Prevention Institute are really the group of people that got together to create this training. So that's what CPI stands for. And their philosophy is this. This is really the purpose of the training, the philosophy, so that we know how to provide the best possible care, welfare, safety, and security for all people involved in a crisis situation. Um, so, there will be an exam at the end of your third night, but don't worry. Um, you know, we, we're really good about helping you guys out, and we review 16,000 times, and we, like Ann says, if you're like, I really help out. So when I say, instead of safety, and you're looking for the word safety, you're like, sounds like <laughs> yeah, she does. that easy. She's very helpful. <laughs> so if you're going to pass, okay, so try not to have chest anxiety. If you're paying attention, kind of taking notes and stuff like that, you'll get it. We'll help you out if you get a block. I mean, I I always had chest anxiety in college, and was, you know, so don't do that. Okay, we want you to just get the information and make it yours. But um, this really is important, that this is really what it's all about. If ever in doubt and you're on the bus in a situation, you're like, oh, God, I don't know what this is CPI, this is what I'm going to do. Think to yourself, real quick, am I doing the best I can do to provide care, welfare, safety, security for everyone involved, for me, for the, the para on the bus, for that student, for all the students around? Am I doing my best to provide that? Yeah. Then you're doing your job. You're doing what CPI wants you to do. So be, feel good about that. That's what's about it. Okay. So I want you to really know this, because that's really what this training is, the, the philosophy of it. All right, move forward. So now we're going to actually switch gears a little bit. We're going to get up. And are we already? Yeah, we are. Okay. And I don't work. We can try. Yeah, we both mics, perhaps. Or just uh -oh. in. I think you left it
aligned with Anne and aligned with me. So like one, facing each other. <laughs> Come on over. Push in and you probably won't all fit, which is why. So you don't have all the I'm sorry, you said no working around. I um, no working. Yeah, we have more people. We're going to need some people to do it over here, too. So, whoever's left. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Do it again. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so, if you we just have a few of you, try to do it like this way. Oh, that's a good idea. Do it this way. So you guys back up as far as you can this way. And then you back this way as far as you can. And do it that way. So if you have somebody across from you, that's kind of your partner. You can see this way. We're going to make it work. Okay, so now look across from you and make sure you know who your partner is. He's on the chair now. What? You missed your place in line. You gotta go find a Brian. Brian, Brian, come over here. to follow the direction, okay? And we're gonna, I'm gonna ask that you, you don't do any talking or laughing and it's gonna be a really quiet exercise, okay? So just follow my directive. Are you ready? So this group right here, this side, you, and then you guys on this side. Okay, are you ready? Okay. I'm gonna have you right now, I know this, can this, this line right here, can you guys scoot back as far as you can? This tape wasn't the best. Okay. Okay. Okay, ready? So the two lines that I spoke with, I am going to um, ask you to walk toward your partner. And then I'm going to ask the opposite lines, okay? So the opposite people, you're going to, they're going to approach you, and when you want them to stop walking toward you, you're just going to put your hand up and say stop. And that's it. And then you're going to maintain eye contact and hold your position. Okay, so everyone's going to end up looking at each other until I tell you something else. Okay, so everybody, you can approach your partner. Go ahead and walk toward them. Look at Brenda. No talking. No talking or laughing. Shh. Hold your position, please. Maintain eye contact. Okay, and stop, and you can come back. Next time you do this, be serious and don't jump at your partner like Brendan did. <laughs> Are you? Okay. All right, so now we're going to switch roles. So if you were the person who did the walking, now you're going to stay where you are and hold your ground and put your hand up when you want them to stop. Okay? So we're going to do the same thing, but you're going to be the one now that says stop when you want them to stop. Go ahead and approach your partner, please. Stop. Stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Please, no talking or laughing. Just hold your position and maintain eye contact. OK, 
okay, you can go back to your position. <laughs> So what does this mean? Get in their face? Okay. What we just did was called the proxemics exercise. Just keep that in mind. We're going to discuss these exercises when we're sitting down and we're done. Okay. About what you thought, what your feelings were, all these kinds of things, what, why we're doing it. Okay. So that was proxemics. The next one we're going to do is called, is about kinesics, excuse me. Um, the kinesics exercise, okay, and we'll, we'll talk about all this when we're done. But this next one now, again, there's going to be no talking, no laughing, maintaining eye contact, um, all that good stuff when we're doing it, okay? Right? Oh, yeah, you guys are a large group. Yeah, large group. Okay, so this time we're going to start with the group in the back here, this, this group toward the kitchen area there, and then this group, opposite of, I'm sorry, <laughs> you guys over here, yep. So follow my direction, okay? Follow what I'm gonna do. Um, and the other group, just stand still, maintain your ground, and just, just hold your position, okay? And we're always gonna maintain eye contact, no talking, no laughing, do the best you can. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the group that I was talking about to please walk towards your partner Go ahead, approach your partner, and stop one large leg length away, and hold. Hold your position. And take one large step into their space, closer to them, and hold. <laughs> Try your best not to laugh or talk. Maintain eye contact. <laughs> Take one small step even further. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs>
okay, on average. Now, think about if you're experiencing a little anxiety, you get a, a student who gets on your bus in the morning or in the afternoon to go home and they've already had something's going on, right? So they've already got anxiety going on. Do you think that their personal space might be a little bit different at that time? Absolutely. So some of the stuff we know and we don't know, okay? Um, but we have to consider that. That's why we do this exercise and talk about it. We always have to think about personal space, okay? Um, some factors that might affect personal space like we talked about. Um, could be gender. Maybe I'm more comfortable and will get closer, allow a female person to get closer to me because it's the same gender, or vice versa. Maybe I'm more comfortable with a male for whatever reason. Okay? Um, size. You know, you got to think about that. Some of the little ones, you're a lot larger than they are, right? So that might be intimidating to some little ones. Maybe not. Maybe it's comforting. So some of these things we don't know, right? Um, cultural background. Maybe an individual is just more comfortable with somebody of their same background. So somebody different coming in is like, whoa, you know, get up off me. Don't, you're too close. I don't know you. I don't understand you. Or things like that, okay? Um, there's a lot of other things that we've talked about in other trainings that have come up. What other factors might affect somebody's personal space and what they're comfortable with? Smell. Smell. Smells, hygiene. Yeah? Yeah, if they're a stranger or they're familiar with you, one or the other, you know, you, you might be more apt to get closer to somebody that you know better. Weapons. Personal appearance. That can affect their factor, yeah? Any others? Past experience. Past experience with you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, another one that comes to my mind is um, a person of authority. I mean, we are all, in our jobs, a person of authority to all of our students, right? So if you think about that and do a vice versa thing, I always think about, I'm out driving my vehicle and get pulled over by a police officer. Am I going to want, when they ask me to step out of the vehicle, am I going to want to get too close? Probably not, right? I mean, they are a person of authority over me at that given moment, okay? So think about that. That's who we are to these kids all the time, right? So that can affect. Um, any others? Can you think of any, Anne, big ones that have come up? So, um, speed of approach. I know on the bus, it's not, you know, it's not quite like you're in the hall or a classroom, but, you know, let's say you're checking something on the bus, you know, you're the driver or the um, paraprofessional on the bus or whatever, and, you know, maybe you're in a hurry or something and this kiddo's just sitting in the back seat and you kind of come up like this, well, they might be like, whoa. Whereas if you're just kind of a little bit slower, they might let you in a little closer, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. you, you might want to talk a little bit about um, the extension of yes. yourself too and what that means, that it's not just your body, but... Yes, very good point. So that's another thing to take into consideration. It is an extension of yourself. So we have uh, students who use wheelchairs. They might use a walker. They might use... Um, they might have, and I know we had a student at the high school that had a backpack with an oxygen tank on it, a purse. I have a big old, I have a lot of things I carry around now. <laughs> um, so those types of things, that, that's a part of me. So it's a little bit wider, you know, once you pack things on or around you that you use, I want you to be even further away from that maybe, right? So you gotta think about those things too. We don't wanna be like, you know, just, and, and I've caught myself doing it. I mean, we all do it, but it's to be really aware of how we are respecting personal space. I might work with a student who uses a wheelchair all the time. Well, we're waiting for something. I don't want to just lean on the back of his or her wheelchair. That is that person. It's, somebody, it's like somebody's leaning on my shoulder. You know, that's invading personal space. It's not very respectful. Okay? So we got to just try to remind ourselves of those things. I also think with the little ones, I do work with the little ones, and I find myself doing this a lot where... Um, but they've got their backpacks on or want to take it off, we kind of kind of manhandle the little ones, you know? We grab them by the hand and here we go. And, you know, we take their backpacks off for them and we put them back on and I grab their arm and I put the coat on and I'm grabbing them and zipping them up for, you know, we do a lot of that. And if a kid is in a, in a somewhat escalated state, we have to remind ourselves you know, even though they're little, we, have, we can't be grabbing them all the time and grabbing their backpacks and um, you know, grabbing their jackets and, you know, kind of shuttle, kind of 
Yeah. Yep. Turn them around. Um, and let them know what you're doing. I was just went through a training of how to do a, a vest for a student um, on a bus and how to, how to put that vest on the student correctly and things like that. So I'm learning about this. And so thinking about that, when I go to put this um, on her at the end of the day, I am saying, okay, here we go. I'm gonna, you know, step toward me. We're gonna step through this. You know, I don't just say, okay, here and grab onto her and go step here and you know all. Of, you want to just respect that personal space and say, because otherwise that might shoot her through the roof already before she gets on your bus. Mm -hmm. you know, sorry, if I ever said that, but you know, so we want to always respect those things and think about that personal space piece. And this particular student also carries about six bags. So you got to remember that as well, right? You, some of you know what I'm not. Okay, right? Okay. So, um, any other thoughts about that on the bus from anybody? Um, personal space and how it's really important. I think to there's a couple of factors here for us to be aware of what our students' personal space is at any given time and to really think about that. To remind ourselves to think about that and look for signs of anxiety maybe regarding personal space. Um, and also be aware of our own personal space and kind of how we're affecting that. Yeah. I was just going to say, I don't drive special ed very often, but, <laughs> but even on a regular route, especially the little kids, sometimes they'll kind of get the in your face or right on top of you and mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, stay away a little bit. Yeah. What's the best way to handle that? Yeah, and you could, um, so Phyllis, right? Phyllis was saying, you know, you're in my area. You can teach them. You know, you can kind of teach them. We do that all the time, too, is, oh, because I, you know, I don't, it doesn't bother me, I guess, to do those exercises, but when I have students that come too close, sometimes I'm like, okay, so then I always teach them, you know, that's a little too close for me. And that's just my point, because you, you know, yeah. sneeze when they're all coughing and sneezing and everything yeah. else. Yeah, right. So you can teach them what your comfort is so that they understand that, oh, well, other people might have a different idea of what personal space is, right? You can try to teach them that. Yeah, good point. And it, it, what's socially appropriate? We've got kids with pretty significant needs that we've been holding hands with for many years. You know, they're still huggers. Yep. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to teach them who you hug and who don't you hug. Yep. When they're little, it's so cute. They can hug everybody. Yeah. And then they get a little bit older, you're like, oh, now that's weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. so it's a social skill, too, that we're using. It's like, oh, no, you need to ask. Yeah. Hi, run my runs now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's all. And that, that's a great thing to be a quarter, putting on the bus, too, is to kind of talk about that with people, compare it on the bus, or teachers put them on the bus. Because even that quick little exchange that we can have about it, say, this is how we do this at school, and you carry it over on the bus, and that Oh, that's huge. That's huge. I mean, now we're just continuing. <laughs> I mean, I'll like, through. Yeah. You're still teaching on the bus. So you're still all teachers there. Um, good point. Any other thoughts about that? So basically the idea here is just that, um, you know, when we kind of invade personal space, um, we can escalate the situation. And just being respectful and honoring and being aware of personal space we can really de-escalate the situation just by doing that. So it's just kind of, you know, you don't think of it that way. It's something we do all the time, but it really can do that. It really is a big deal. Well, you, I think you said remembering that you're, you're with this house and not yep. forced Yes. 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 We did handle it, don't we? I mean, yeah. We have to, I mean, we have to be able to make sure You're right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you hear that? We didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? Yeah. So he was, what's your name? Ron. Ron? Ron was just made a really good point that part of your job is that you kind of have to invade the personal space because you've got to get them belted in. You've got to have everything safe. And to just kind of maybe um, be aware that you are doing that and that that could create some anxiety, but do the best that you can maybe to um, explain that, okay, I'm putting on your seatbelt now, even though like they see it coming in, but try to alleviate that the best that you can. Yeah. I, Comments? I was going to say the same thing, that, um, you know, when I have to grab a kid by the hand, first of all, I like just to do this so they can see that I need their hand, you know, and I was going to give it to me, you know, and they do it great, it's not always going to happen. But 
but now at least they know this is kind of, they know where I'm going to, now I'm coming in for your hand, because they need your hand. If you're going to belt kids in, you say, okay, you know, we're going to belt you, find the clip, even if they can help you find the clip, and now you're going to go in to help, they know what's expected. Yeah. They know you're coming in, so you have to invade the space. I get it, but you know. Yeah, good point. Anybody else? Okay. So that's what the proxemics was all about. So when we did those exercises, it was just to give you an idea of what it might feel like. Um, I mean, I know that, yep, I know that um, we saw some signs of anxiety, even though we're just peers in the room and we're going through training in a safe situation. So it's to get you to think, I mean, we saw it. We saw the whole, like, and the giggling and the looking away and some people were turning red and it was hard to maintain eye contact. We saw all of that going on. It always happens. If Anne, Anne can't even do it, you know, she can't even do the exercise. So we get that. So it's just to give you an idea that now imagine what it's like for a student who might already be experiencing anxiety about something else that happened, and now if there's a personal space thing that happens, they increase even more. So they're escalating even more. So those little things that, just to give you an idea to think about those things. The second thing we did in the back that was even trickier, I think, was kinesics. That's the fancy word for um, body language, basically, okay? Um, so yeah, Anne's gonna put all this up there. You can write down what you want. But it can include facial expressions, gestures, posture, movements, all those things. So it's basically everything besides your words, okay? So it's your body language. So, Signs of anxiety, what might that look like in body language? What, what have you seen on the bus? They're hitting their heads. Change of breathing. They change their breathing. Maybe, they, maybe their breathing kind of increases. They rock. It's a big one. <laughs> Plug in their ears. Click? Click. Who said click? Oh, clicking, yes. Can you hear Bill back there? Bill's anxious. Okay. Yeah. Grinding their teeth. Wringing their hands. Avoiding eye contact. Yep, avoiding, that could be, avoiding eye contact. Rocking. Yeah. Humming. Skirt, well, that skirting is kind of verbal, but still. But yeah, so there's a lot of things. So you guys are very aware of kind of what that might look like and some of the signs to look for, like, whoa, something's going on with this one. Yeah. Um, and like Ann said, some of our kids with special needs live in a state of anxiety, too. So if some of these things increase or decrease, we'll give you an idea that, okay, something's going on here even more. Um, so to be aware of that body language. So when we did that exercise in the back and you had to stop and hold and then get even closer and stop and hold. Part of that was personal space too because you were in the that. But even more it was we kind of were thinking about, you know, you're face to face, eye to eye. You're kind of forced to have that eye contact. Does eye contact work with everybody? No, we know that, right? So that is, you know, when you're forced with that eye contact, that is not a comfortable thing. Um, shoulder to shoulder, it's kind of an intimidating thing to be looking at, I think, for most people. Um, and then you're up close and personal, so there's kind of some personal space and body language in that exercise. Um, at the end of the exercise then, when you had to hold and all that stuff, and then I asked you to step back, you know, step back, and I know by then, you know, you probably didn't hear me, but <laughs> we went into the CPI supportive stance, and we'll go into that next but I want you to step back and off to the side. That way you're not face to face, okay? So we'll get more into that. So we want to be really aware of our students' body language. What are they showing us by all of those things you just said? The rocking and the clicking and the flapping and the whatever else might happen. We want to be aware of their body language so that we know, okay, where are they at? Are they experiencing anxiety right now? And how are we going to respond to that? Be very aware of theirs. And also, let's be aware of ours. Oops, I'm sorry. Be aware of our own body language. How am I, how are they perceiving me? Am I walking up straight on like this? Well, that might be a little bit more intimidating than if I were a little bit off to the side, a little bit relaxed, my hands are down, things like that. Maybe I'm not so intimidating then to my student on the bus. 
granted we know that typically we're standing on the bus, right? You're standing and they're sitting, so already you've got that differential. If there's something that you need to get in there personal with or talk to them about, you may want to see if you can, you know, sit on the seat opposite of them, or is that something you do? Or get, you know, just get down for a little bit and see if you can get more to their level. That can help a lot to de-escalate a situation. <coughs> Um, so again, it's just to be aware of their body language so that there's signs that you're aware of and you know how to respond to those and then of our own. I know I have always been a big kind of, it's just comfortable to kind of stand like this or like this. I have to remind myself when I'm in a situation, hands at the sides, just relax, don't go in there. That can be very intimidating or, you know, I'm sending a different message that I really don't mean, you know. Um, what? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you don't know. You, <laughs> I mean, I might be looking like that, you know, and I don't mean it, right? So I have to be really cognizant of how I'm approaching students because I don't want them to think that, right? And I don't want them to think that I'm going to jump down their throat, okay? I, I sometimes, though, I find myself doing this a lot. And I do, too. And I, for a lot of the kids that I work with that I am going hands-on with, I think if they see my hands out, they're thinking she's going to take what I have. She's going to put that uh, work in front of me again, or she's going to grab me. She's doing something. She's going to do something. So if I can have my hands like this, I feel like it's a little less threatening because they think, well, at least her hands are all tied up there. She's not going to have Yeah. Well, and so it could be, it could work both ways, I guess. You know, um, so just, kind of, I guess, know your student, kind of know your situation, um, and figure out what do you think would be best. So I guess. Typically, I think, you know, the, the best way, but then we don't all walk around that way all the time, is just hands down to the side and relaxed kind of a thing, um, which we'll get into next. But any questions about that, that exercise in the back? Well, first of all, let's talk about how we felt doing that exercise in the back, too, before we move on, because I was seeing all kinds of things. <laughs> My partner wouldn't quit laughing, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of laughing. But that could have been a sign of anxiety and discomfort. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. It was a part that I was thinking, I wonder what she's thinking. <laughs> right, well, and that, yeah, and that's uncomfortable. Right, you're wondering, oh, I just ate and it didn't Right, yeah. So next next time we get together next week everybody will have tic tac gum something. Yeah. We get out close and personal on this thing. Yes. I was thinking I just ate uh, onions. Right. I know. You got to be careful. So think about that on the bus. No, but really, this is really a good point. Think about that on the bus. Yes. Yes. They'll tell you. Exactly. And that might really make somebody. That might. Who said smell when we were talking about stuff earlier? I mean, that might really, really. Some people might really be offended by that. I mean, for real. Yeah. So I've got a kid, and I took a lot of coffee and. And then they'll have other behaviors and you'll wonder why. And it could be because your breath stinks, right? It could. And on a bus, I mean, think about that. It's all close and small. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. Some of the cultures, you know, when they eat certain foods or mm -hmm. they're cooking certain foods. Um, we have a little boy that gets on the bus and the other kids, when they're specially needs, they kind of say what they want to say they don't care oh, right. right if they're hurting somebody's feelings yeah and they will say oh he stinks yeah. and it's the food that he had for breakfast and probably got on the jackets or the clothes sure so the whole bus smells with the small bus 
Sir, sure, like that food. Yeah. Well, like me after an Italian. Right. And the next day, it's <laughs> straight garlic. Yeah. It's like a small lot of people walk in and wonder what that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's good to be aware of these things. So it's good you guys are aware of it so you know when it's kind of, okay, well, this could be an issue. You know, so you kind of know if something starts. So what do we do in those situations? We can't help. We can't help what people are eating or what the smells are like necessarily. I mean, you could crack a window, I guess, if, if it's not freezing out. But how do we? What do we do with that gun on a bus? Acknowledge it. Talk about it. That one and a half to three feet suddenly becomes three to six feet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know, we've given kids items to hold that do smell good. You know, if there's something that, um, you know, even like a, uh, an item from home or something, you can see them kind of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, we've done aromatherapy kind of stuff too, like the lavenders or whatever, if they can have something that has that smell that they do like on it, mm -hmm. it's calming and um, covers up. Yeah. Whatever they don't like, you know. And I'm thinking about, I should have this actually. Well, I was just thinking too, have that conversation with the para or if you can, somebody who's getting them on the bus so that that can be then related to the case manager and people probably aren't aware of that. So there could be this issue on the bus every day all the time and nobody knows about it so it doesn't get communicated maybe back to home or to a case manager where we could help out with something like that in a bus situation. Oh yeah, you should always so, tell. So tell people so, about it. Yeah, yeah. Because we could probably come, you know, come up with things like that and then you could, you know, maybe your issue would be over. I wouldn't mind, up, like, riding the bus home, even just to see if there's like the same strange behavior and you don't know where it's coming from. I mean, I wouldn't mind. I could give you right back. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Yeah, but not everybody will do that. Now. Just, I'm just saying. Anne will, if you have one of her kids. But I think I think anybody, any case manager that you ask and said, here's this behavior, I can't yeah. figure it out. Do you have any strategies? Yeah. They will probably come up with something. Yeah. So tell a para. If you don't see a case manager, tell a para and go, okay, this is weird, but I was just told in training that we should really tell you guys this. Do you say my name? I don't care. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just say, we just went through this training. We want to communicate this with you. We know it's important. Please get this information back to who it needs to get to, but we really are seeing this on the bus. What can we do? Right? Because we should all, we're a team here. We should all, we all are affecting these kids' lives every day. Mm -hmm. Right, so we're all a team. Privacy. What's that? It's a privacy. A privacy matter? Yes. What is a privacy yes. matter? If you ask something about the condition of the student, we're not uh, allowed to know that. Unless it's in our book. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a condition. Yeah, but it's a lot of that behavior uh, uh, related to condition of student. But what we can talk about is we can say, this is what I'm noticing on the bus, that they seem to get really anxious about the smell or when I make a wrong turn. I'm not sure what's going on here with this student. Do you, can you help me at all? Can you ask the case manager or ask the teacher, can, can we figure out what's going on because this is what I'm seeing on the bus? And we can, that information can be shared with the case manager at school. What information do you get about a student? Maybe somebody else didn't notice it. And so hopefully that individual then was contacting parents and all that stuff. That's good. Yeah, there's a lot of times uh, when we go to a school, we don't know 
who a case manager is, if it's a parent, if it's a teacher, we don't know anything mm -hmm. about who picks them up. And sometimes we'll ask the students if they, you know, can tell us. But other than that, we don't really know who anybody is. And I think that's why we're involving Bill more in that process. So if you have a concern, you need to go to Bill because there's certain um, issues regarding confidentiality mm -hmm. um, that we have to honor. Yeah. Um, but if you are personally observing observing something, you can go ahead and mention something to Bill or and then because he'll be getting involved more in that process so we can <coughs> get more information um, and, and become more engaged in that. Yeah. Uh, so but yes, I mean there's kind of that balance between you know reporting certain situations that you personally are aware of and some in situations where we can't give you the information because there's data privacy. Right. So or it's, out of, yeah. it's out of our hands anyway. It's out of our control anyway. We'll get more into that too. That's one of the tough things about this job. Um, what's in your control and what's not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that if if there's something going on that's that's odd or that you think is this what it's going to be like every single day. If you talk to Bill and said, okay, here's the student, he can contact yeah. the school, which would, they probably want to leave first, and then they'll find out who that case manager is, and they might really have a really simple strategy that, that we can implement on the bus. We can make visual cards for you and mm -hmm. um, you know implement them on the bus. Yeah. There are things that we can do. So I think Bill's your guy. Yeah. So. Good. Anybody else on any of this stuff? Personal space, body language. It's kind of huge with you guys on the bus. It's close proximity. I mean, I'm seeing some of the buses this year, and they are packed. Tapped. I mean, you all have a lot of kids on your buses this year. Um, so this really can, it's a big deal. It really can affect how your rides might go. All right, we'll move forward. There's one little extra piece to this. At the bottom, I think, of your page. Right or, the, or no, I guess not, to the side. Um, CPI supportive stance. So, um, do they have the same picture in their books? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh my God. They did not update her. Can, I, can we tell the story? Ann and I, for the last what? We've been teaching this together now for what, three, four years? We have been saying since year one, we have got to come in dressed like this one day with this outfit on. But we've yet to go shopping. I know. I so get that. we could get that going. I know. I even wrote, this is my book that I mean it's in a million pieces that when I was first trying years and years ago, I actually wrote a note to myself with an arrow that says she should not wear high waisted pleated pants. Nobody <laughs> should. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> should. It was a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So so anyway, when, so when we did the the last exercise and then at the end, I know you couldn't hear me because you were all just laughing and wanted to get away from your partner. But what I tried to say at the end was take one large step away um, from your partner facing off to the side. Well, that would have put you in the CPI supportive stance was supposed to be the idea there. Basically, okay, CPI supportive stance. This is a test question. But don't worry, because you're going to be using it a lot. We're going to be talking about it a lot. Do you want to show, like, if, we were, yep. if we were facing each other, mm -hmm. and then would she... Um, and then I'm up here, can I do it, or are you okay? Just do it. <laughs> and then I went like this. Right. Okay, so I'm not face to face. Okay, so what, what we like to say is that it's less intimidating. Well, we'll say the reasons. What are the reasons why we use it? There's three reasons. This is what you have to know. You have to know what it looks like, and you have to know the three reasons why we use it. It communicates respect by honoring that personal space, right? So you're outside. The idea here is that, here, say, here's this guy's bubble. Well, she's outside of it, she's not in too close. She's honoring that personal space, respecting personal space, okay? It's non-threatening and non-challenging. Why? Because she's kind of off to the side with her hands down at her side. Now, you don't need to go like this, right? We're not gonna walk around that way. Um, but you wanna have your arms down. Somebody said that Laura, didn't she the lead over at Forest Hills that I walk around that way or something? Yeah, she says something like you're always in. Crisis mode? <laughs> but anyway, so but you want to kind of be relaxed. Arms at your side, you want to try to do that, right? So that's it's non-threatening, not okay, non-challenging, because you're not face to face like this, shoulder to shoulder. You're kind of off to the side with your hands down, okay? Non-threatening, non-challenging. And then it also um, it's for staff's personal safety. Offers an escape route. So by that I mean that 
You see she's off to the side like that instead of face to face. If I am shoulder to shoulder with you, okay, so I'm up close and personal and we're standing like this and you decide that you are really ticked off now and you're going to start, you know, throwing blows or, you know, kicking or whatever, spitting, whatever you might want to do, it's all going to hit me right here in the important parts, okay? If I'm off to the side, I'm still going to get kicked or hit or something thrown at me or whatever. It's still going to hurt, right? But it's going to hit me here and it's not going to do the damage that it would, okay? Also, I'm already kind of off to the side, so I know this doesn't affect you as much on the bus, but it could, right? You guys, can, this still can happen to you on the bus. Um, it offers, you're, you're already kind of, I always call it halfway out the door, right? If you're this way, you've got to kind of make a complete turn. If you're this way already, you're kind of, you can just move quickly to safety, okay? So you're already turned to the side. So again, three reasons. It honors or respects personal space of your individual. It's non-threatening or non-challenging. And um, personal safety. So those are your three. Yes, Bill? It's almost natural for you guys to walk up and down the aisles kind of sideways because like me, <laughs> we don't all fit <laughs> facing forward. <laughs> I do. But, <laughs> but I think some of you all, before, I've already mentioned that when you approach someone, uh, especially if they're agitated, don't square up with them. Maintain that natural uh, supportive stance that you walk down the aisle with, mm -hmm. okay? So. I, I feel like I'm asking or saying too much, but is this is this just for one culture? Because culturally, in my in my culture, if I stand sideways, it's a sign of weakness. I'm just saying, and you know. Um, and that's a good point. That's a really good point. And I think um, it's what's that? I was going to say that's number two. It is non-threatening, non-challenging. Right. And so it's so it's it's good that it's not threatening. Um, but it. I think if we. We don't need to make it as literal. I mean, we don't have to look at the pictures and make it as exact as they say, like exactly this way. I would say just as long as you're not completely square on and just be relaxed, I think is really the idea of CPI supportive stance. Just kind of be ready, be able, and as we do the physical stuff too, you want to be able to be comfortable so you can shift your weight back and forth. You're moving on the bus, you're not like stiff and stuck somewhere. You're able to move around. You're not kind of shoulder, you know, face on. You're not squared up with somebody. You're off a little bit to the side. I guess it depend on the situation. I mean, if you're with a kid that's escalating, you don't want to, you know, your goal is not to look strong and Right. Know, intimidated. Right. That's right. not your goal. Your goal is, if you want to interpret it as, as weak or backing down, great. Is really, it's really, you want to be not threatened. No, I, yeah. I, I get that, but it, I'm just saying, come in from my perspective, as a black person, mm -hmm. even a little kid that's black, if he sees you, they, any, they look for any sign of, of weakness. And if you stand like this, that's a sign of weakness to him. And I'm gonna I'm gonna beg to differ with you because no, I work with a lot of little kids and when I'm still I'll sit while they're standing and they still know in their room I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I mean honestly, it is the relationship that you build with that student. I can have my back to them and I'm still the one in charge. I'm happy for that you, but that's not what I thought. <laughs> 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 well, when Ann says turn her back, I mean, that, that's not what we would recommend to all of you. It's because she knows this individual extremely well. Punches, I'm not Right. Yeah, did you have a comment? Please, no one can hear you. <laughs> what? And when you take the, the, the supportive stands, um, that's an opportunity. You don't know when someone is going to try to kick you or punch you. Right. But that's an opportunity. You're already at the stance to block. Yep. Or exactly. Or that's part of it. Yep. Yeah. It's for personal safety, too, for you. So it does offer several things. We would rather have you be less intimidating because you're already a person of authority. You're already there. You kind of already are the boss. And so we'd rather have you looking that way than intimidating somebody to the point where now they're escalated even further or have even more anxiety. And if they're going to kick you, would you rather be face on or would you rather be like this? That's like you say. It's important stuff here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I understand all that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, 
the culture of the current My culture, <laughs> if I stand like that, I get knocked down. You, what you, are you feeling like that would happen on your bus with your students? Uh, if, if the person is bigger than me and he, and he thinks I'm a woman, he might. Okay. Let me, uh, just this year, I've had to work with a student who is bigger than me, blacker than me, tougher than me probably. But, I'm just calling it real the way it is. Okay. But, my approach, my approach was always sideways. It was always a sport of things. But, Andrew, did he ever feel like I was weak? No. He never had any problems with either of us. And Andrew's a little guy. Well, 